Hey, I'm going to be Freaks. I am Frank, and I'm here with Lori Calcaterra once again. How are you doing, Lori? I'm great. Thanks for having me on. I love coming on this show. I appreciate it. We're here to talk about Path of the Pale Rider, and this is issue number four we're talking about, right? No, we are talking about the trade paperback. That's right. Issues one through four. There we Issues go. Issues one through four <laughs> in the trade paperback. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> This is such an amazing story. Can you give everybody kind of a rundown of what's going on in this world again? Yeah. So we broke death, kind mm -hmm. of. Your body can die, but your soul or energy doesn't leave your body upon death. Meaning you get to hang out for your own decay phase, which is terrifying. Um, yeah. But you're still you. You're not trying to eat people. You're not craving brains, but you get like forgetful or violent or detached, just depending on how your brain rots in, in your skull. Um, and it's people, animals, insects, nothing dies correctly anymore. And if you really think about that type of a world and all the implications that, you know, happen because of death being broken, it's terrifying. Everything from food and water and politics, ethical questions, society just crumbles. So when we started the story, we were 10 years into that specific apocalypse and um, we follow our cowboy Jude St. Clair and he's like the last guy that's still looking for the answer, which is, you know, why did the dead no longer die? You right. know? Um, so as the story goes on, I, I do some time jumps. You get to see the beginning, um, the very early days and like how Jude and his family uh, go through the apocalypse and we just wrapped up issue number four. Um, and that was kind of like his trauma, his big trauma, what pushed him out of the door and, um, out of the proverbial frying pan and into the fire. So, um, what I really like about the trade though, is when, when I originally wrote this script, um, it was a full length movie. Right. So it's intended to be read one after the other we had to break it up into issues so we could afford to produce art, but this is how we want you to see it. This is how we yes. want you to read it as a whole. This yeah. is the movie. This is the cinematic version. Basically. Yeah. So that's great. One through four, is kind of like your act one wow. of the movie. There's still act two and act three coming. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. yeah this is your first trade. What was the experience yeah. like going to a trade? Terrifying. I yeah. have no idea what's going to ha happen. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because I mean, there's there's definitely like the story's been out there, but how do you you go to the same audience and say, hey, do you guys want the full version of it? I know for myself, I'm excited to get it, but how are you pitching that to people like you know? All right. More? So when we first started, um, issue number one was produced in black and white, and mm -hmm. has been produced in black and white. So all of the printings that we've done in the bookstores carry, and all my fans, they all have the black and white version. We have colored issue number one nice and relettered issue number one oh, wow. so it has this new there's a new feel to it and oh my god the end just hits that much harder for those of you who have read issue number one and you know what happens on i-93 and the aftermath just wait until you see all the red <laughs> <laughs> it's a different feel to it um yeah. I'm sorry. It's traumatic. Anyway, but you get to read it in color. Uh, and of course, it's issues one through four. But it, we also crammed in a ton of bonus material. So you get glimpses into the script. You get um, every single variant cover that we have produced in the back. You get I drew a map of the apocalypse according to Jude St. Clair and his travels. You might even have a little peek of where he's going. Um, there's what else is there? There's, uh, oh, I wrote some more journal entries from Jude St. Clair. So there's there's journal entries that have not been seen prior to. And one of them has a back door into one of the riddles that we did previously. So if you weren't yeah. able to solve one of the riddles, we're giving it to you. But there we go. it's all part of the story, you know, and, um, the riddles and the, and the short films that we do enhance everything. So in my opinion, if you haven't solved them, you haven't gotten to see these things, you're missing out on some of the goodies. So absolutely give it to me. i like it's being this like bonus material and stuff like that while mm -hmm. you're working on these first four issues you and your team is there anything that you guys are like oh we just can't fit this in but let's save it for the trade is that kind of happening here um not necessarily saving it for the trade but saving it for like the bonus material that happens right. all the time that's so cool um the scripts i wrote back in 2018 
I just want to remind people that because especially like issue number three reminds you a lot of what we went through in the pandemic. It's scary to me sometimes mm -hmm. when I go and read it, how accurately that was portrayed. Um, but like, for example, Jude's relationship with his family, there's some traumatic things that happen that we didn't really have too much time to develop. And that's what we tell in our short stories and our, our short films. And that's where like, if you participate in the, the riddles, it, you get to go a little bit deeper and understand how the world works, the mechanics. But um, some of the riddles, it's like it's real where you get to interact. Yeah. You get to call phone numbers and find hidden YouTube videos like you, um, you stumble upon a video from Anonymous on the Internet. Mm -hmm. Or you solve a riddle and something shows up in your mailbox, some correspondence from one of the characters. So there's just so much more to find. Um, but really, it just depends on your level of participation, what you want. Because the comics are the meat and potatoes, the main story. You're going to be just fine if you just read the comics. But all this other stuff is, is fun to do and will enhance the story. You have one of the most engaged audiences I've seen a comic book writer have. It's so cool to see this community. How, how are you communicating with them? Are you keeping them up to date as you go? Because these riddles come out, for example, and it feels like, oh, guys, hey, guys, there's a new riddle out. How engaged mm -hmm. are they? Um, well, most of the highly engaged people are in my Facebook group. Yeah. Um, that's kind of where I drop most of the, you know, the fun stuff, the polls for the slice and dice, um, any kind of like naming characters or like polls about future merch. That's where the people who want to be influential in how I develop the project, that's where they are. Um, okay. But I also have, I have an Instagram, I have a TikTok, I, you know what I mean? I, I have a website, um, whatever social media people are comfortable on, um, I'm there. Mm -hmm. So I'm always open to feedback. I'm always open to people, you know, suggesting things. But yeah, I communicate with everybody a lot, you know, throughout the course of the Kickstarter um, after the Kickstarter, as we start our production, I'll give sneak peeks of the art so people know where we're at, you know, when we go to print, when we go to edit, all, all of that. Um, they're all in the loop just so, you know, they know where we are. It's like, it's part of the fun to, to yeah. see the sneak peeks and the behind the scenes and the cool like, merch that comes in. Yeah. Stuff. So you have an amazing community. How much are you trying to feed to your community and how much are you trying to grab a new audience? Probably 50-50. I spend, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of time in the community, building the community. But that that to me is the fun stuff. Like they're already on board. We're just, right. we're having fun. We're building playlists of music for the apocalypse, stuff like that. But I'm always looking for the new readers that maybe haven't found us yet. That's, I think, the hardest part of indie is we have such cool stuff, but mm -hmm. people don't know we exist. So you got to spend time. Um, looking in some of the groups that are maybe adjacent to what you do. So I'm in all like the indie comics groups, indie comic fan, you know, groups and um, blah, blah, blah. I'm also in the zombie groups, the horror groups, the Western groups, the movie groups. You know what I mean? The yeah. women and filmmaker groups. I'm in all of those too. I might not dump as much into there, but I will put out feelers and I will get followers. Um, yeah. Carissa Grant did something really smart the other day. And I asked her permission if I could copy her where she put her PDF of issue number one out there. And she was like, Hey, if you like this, this, and this, do you want to read the first issue of worthy chaos? If this is what we're about. So I, I asked her, I was like, can I do that? So I did that. I was like, yeah. who wants to read, you know, path of the pill writer issue number one for free. And I had a ton of people and I probably had about 12 people sign up for a uh, pre-launch based off of just that. And it's people that I had not previously talked to. So there's ways out there to reach a new audience. There's yeah. Them. And luckily with this comic book, there's such good crossover. I like how you're saying horror and Western and, and, and movie. <laughs> that's really good. That's a really good point. Um, yeah. In this one, you're also going to be going to international audiences and you're working, you said with um, ASAP imagination can you tell yeah. me about that process and, and how that relationship was formed? Oh, okay. So ASAP Imagination is amazing. Um, mm -hmm. They have their own kind of Marvel universe built yeah. um, where they have several stories built in that universe. And then they have what they call any one world, which is how I found them. 
So they're publishing independent creator stories. Um, so I started out with doing like a digital distribution with them. And um, they're, they're super nice. They're funny. They get stuff done. They're growing. Um, when I joined last year, it was just a handful of indies. And they have, you should go check out their website. Really um, amazing. Huge number of indie comic books novels novellas kids books minis like they have so much stuff at this point um and they will print your books digitally dis distribute your books um they'll distribute merchandise for you they have all these different kind of packages that they can do um and they're based in the uk but they also have a branch in canada so as our as our relationship grew um, I took over a podcast for them. So on Wednesdays, I host a podcast called Any One World Showcase. I get to give those indie creators kind of their 15 minutes of fame, which is awesome. I've met so many wonderful people. It, it's nuts. Um, and that's part of the fun of it to be like, what are you yeah. working on? Because I want to, you know, I want to know. Um, so I took over that. And then I was like, hey, I'm coming up to my trade paperback. And they are working on getting their books into Barnes and Noble, uh, Indigo, and Waterstone. And I was wow. like, this is just perfect timing, right? Because if you're going to push trades into these stores, I'm just finished. I'm going to be finishing my trade about that time. Mm -hmm. It just made sense. So that's, I was really excited because I have not done international shipping for any of my previous issues. And I have followers and fans overseas. I have a lot of fans in the UK, um, Denmark, Iceland, Australia. And I really wish they could have that physical copy experience. Yeah. Um, we just can't afford it, you know, with the international shipping. So what, what this is going to do for us is that the Kickstarter is going to be US only as normal, mm -hmm. but there's going to be a link to the Lori Calcaterra collection on ASAP Imagination's website. And if you're an international backer and you're looking for that physical copy, you click that link, it'll take you right over and you can pre-order a copy. And yeah. then the Kickstarter will end, everything will go into production at the same time and everybody will get their books. So I'm very excited for that. How cool is the idea of your book being in Barnes & Noble? I mean, my goodness. <laughs> Amazing. They already have their collection on their website mm -hmm. digitally, but he's working on getting physical copies into the store. Um, there's over 600 stores in the United States. Yeah. I mean, I'll go just to kind of peruse and right? imagining seeing, I mean, we all know that Path of the Pale Rider cover so freaking dope that that's going to catch eyes. I can't wait for people to, to explore and, and find that naturally that way. I'm like, what the heck is this thing? Is that a yeah. bear? Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> I can't wait. Yeah. If it's there someday, I'm going to go just take a picture. You're like, it's selfie with me and my book on the shelf. See it? You make sure to tell me. I'll be <laughs> heading to my local Barnes & Noble just to kind of yeah. be like standing next to it like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know her. <laughs> now, you talked about relettering that first book. Why did you feel like you needed to relitter it? Um, when we started issue one, I had never lettered before. Yeah. Um, I broke quite a few rules. I mean, it was readable, it was legible. There was nothing per se difficult about it where it took you out of the story, but I, I developed my own style starting with issue number two, which I have continued in. So I wanted to go back and gave it, give it the same look, the same feel because again, it's it's one story. I don't want it to be issue one, black and white, issue two in color, issue three and four. And they're all slightly different. Yeah. I want it to be a one cohesive story where you fall into it and you just read it through the end. So it was important to me to, to, to make it cohesive in the lettering as well as the color. That's a great point. We've interviewed letterers in the past. and I think it's one of the more, or it's, it's so underappreciated in the world yeah. of comic books. What, are, what is something you've learned in the process of perfecting your lettering? Um, don't cover the art. <laughs> That's well, good. I mean, mm -hmm. it's it's a balance between like how big you want your bubble. There mm -hmm. needs to be space between the letters and the edge. So it looks, it reads, um, it reads well, but you're always trying to manage the space that the art is in. So if there's just empty space in the back, sorry, if there's yeah. just empty space in the back, it doesn't matter where your, you know, your bubble is not covering something essential. It's when there's like, back and forth conversation like how do you make sure that the, the reader is reading it correctly 
go like start at the left corner, you know, for the beginning of the conversation and then slightly lower, but to the right and then slightly lower to the left for the next part. So it yeah. needs to, there's an order to it. Mm-hmm. Um, all of that, uh, you need to be consistent with your tails um, to make sure that they're not like one's really long, one's really short. It's okay to break some rules if the art demands it, but as a whole, you try to be consistent. The goal of a letterer, which this is so sad, is to not be noticed. Yeah. <laughs> when you do it right, people don't notice you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you just, yeah. the conversation just flows. And that's different for like the SFX. So like the booms, the crash, the screeching, um, those obviously you want to tap into the emotion and the mood behind what's going on. So um, those should stand out, and but they should make sense. Like you're not mm-hmm. doing things in beautiful pinks and pastels in a horror book. Right, right, right. It should be a lot of red. Yeah. Red, mm-hmm. dark, noir, you know what I mean? Like yeah. it just, you have to fit the tone of what's going on. So I learned quite a bit about lettering and, um, yeah, and that, unfortunately that's what I'm tuned. I know that everybody does this. So like if you're a pencil or an inker, that's what you're kind of tuned into when you're reading mm-hmm. other comic books. So I'm always tuned into the the lettering to see like, oh, maybe they don't know the rule. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you you could express emotion too through the lettering and that could be difficult to choose when it's good move to kind of add some artistic flair or, oh, let's scale it back a little bit, you know? Yeah. And I, I have um, a friend of mine, Jason Alexander, um, Mm -hmm. and he does horror comics and I, I really respect him and um, I will bounce things off of him too. And in like pacing, like if people are shouting and you have like the, the jagged box, Instead yeah. of the round, you know, smooth box, the bubble, um, like at one point, I think I had I had them going back to like low tones and he was like, it's too soon. There's still it's high tension. So I was like, OK, so I kept the text the same, but I changed it back to the spiky bubble and it worked better. Oh, wow. You know what I yeah. mean? So something just yeah. like changing the shape of the bubble will change the mood and the pacing of the action on the page. Yeah. So I talked to one um, Lentz, Dave Lentz, who when he wanted to make it look like the guy was speaking too fast, he would reduce the spacing in between the words. And it's like yeah. such a small move, but as a reader, you're not even paying attention to the fact that all of a sudden you're reading it faster. And yeah. Yeah. And that's important too, because letterers have to deal with sound, which we don't have. Mm-hmm. So how do you convey to the reader something that's really loud or really quiet? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a challenge, you know, and that's some of the things that we do. Like he's talking super fast. So you got to cram the letters together. Or like one of the panels I did, there was a a car accident. So there was like an ambulance and it was just full of noise. So I put like all the SFX, I filled up all the extra space with like sirens and screaming and things on fire. And I just made it really chaotic. Um, Hoping that people would hear in their head the chaos of that scene. So it's just stuff like that. That's it's, it's a challenge in a 2D medium. Yeah. It makes you feel that anxiety of the moment too, when you're just like, there's so much going on. Yeah. That's, yeah. It's interesting that it's a kind of a, it's a hybrid of the writer and the artist that mm-hmm. sometimes the writer doesn't get to necessarily affect the art and vice versa, but that that's the place where you can do it. That's interesting. Yeah. Right. Or the writer or the, the letterer does nothing. I've had scenes where the emotion is so apparent. I don't yeah. need to put anything. I just leave it silent yeah. and let the emotion play out. Huh. It's mm-hmm. such a, it's such a fascinating, and like I said before, under, underappreciated yeah. in the world of, of comic books. It's pretty great. Um, let's talk about you do the live stream and it's one of my favorite things about your campaigns and this one we have coming out on Monday. So we, unfortunately, when the interview comes out, it's already been done, but you guys, if you watched my social media, I'm going to be posting about it like crazy. Can you tell us about your live streams? Yes. Okay. All right. Yes. So I love to do a live launch. So it's nervous as I'll get out, but it's, it's a ton of fun. Where people get to come, um, usually we start 30 minutes prior to launch Mm -hmm. and I will pull up the preview and I love it because I take people through the campaign. I show them all the cool stuff Yeah. Um, and it helps them kind of make a decision on what backer level they want before I push the live. Um, And that's key sometimes when I only have like five of a certain item available and if they're gunning for it, then they're like, okay, she's about to push the button. Okay, go and you can go get it. You know, on some campaigns, I only have a single item because right. I make these Funko Pops and the new Funko Pop, there's just one um, every campaign. So people have been 
fighting for that one. Um, yeah. There's been one reigning champion so far, and I feel like if she were to lose at this point, she'd show up on my porch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, yeah. I need my Funko. Like, okay, okay, I'll order you an extra <laughs> one. Um, but I, the lives are just a ton of fun, and like people can come and encourage because even though a lot of times I don't look um, anxious, I am. I'm super yeah. anxious. Um, every Kickstarter that, you know, we as new, newish creators, um, launch, you always get that imposter syndrome and you feel like, you know, I'm going to push a button and nothing's going to happen, but it never, it never turns out that way, but that's how we always feel. So it's good for encouragement. It's good to see the numbers go. Um, you know, it's good for people to share that live stream out on their social media, just to hit a bigger audience. It's good for a lot of different things. But, um, but that way people know exactly what time I'm launching if they're mm -hmm. specifically looking for an exclusive item. And, and they're really fun for you hear from other uh, indie creators or people that are in the space and to hear how they helped with your project and the projects they got going on. So it's not just check out this campaign. It's also like check out this community that I'm a part of. So I, I, it's yeah. a lot of fun to check out, guys. Yeah, I always have on the bottom of my campaign, I suggest other campaigns that are running or are going to be running soon because um, there's a ton of good stuff out there in indie yeah. that, you know, and if you're just following Path of the Pale Rider, maybe you don't know there's a story coming out about a man who's been angry with a giant fish. Yeah. <laughs> right? Sounds so crazy, but when you hear about the writer talk about it, you're like, I mean, I want to know about that angry fish. <laughs> and I mean, like, it, it sounds so simple, but when you look at the art, it's amazing. And yeah. I'm just giving, you know, I'm being silly, but it's a really nuanced and um, thoughtful story. So uh, this is, it's so cool that there's so much good stuff out there. And it's like, scroll down to the bottom and just go look and see. And if something, you know, catches your eye, go look. Yeah. Can't hurt you. Uh, guys, I've, I've said in the past, but it's important you follow Lori, not just because of Path of the Pale Rider, which is a phenomenal book, but because of everything else that she's doing. And it's just a really good example of how to build a community and build a really cool campaign. I will lastly, I want to touch on your kicks or your TikTok. We talked about your TikTok in the past, yeah. but you've been doing something new. Can you tell people what you've been working on over there? Yeah, I fell into book talk like yeah. really hard. And um, I was watching people bind books or more specifically rebind books. That's what caught me. So mm -hmm. someone was like, look what I'm doing and like ripped a cover off of a Harry Potter book. And I was like, oh, my heart. Like, right? yeah. I don't know what to <laughs> oh, what just happened? And then I watched and they did like this whole rebind. They made it hardcover. They printed their own part, like HTV to like iron on the cover and the book cloth and painted the edges and made it super cool. And I wanted to do that. So I did. <laughs> so first I ripped the cover off my Harry Potter book and um, I learned how to rebind soft cover books. But then I learned how to actually print, cut, ditch, and glue my own text block. So one of the things I'm offering on this next campaign is a 100% handcrafted mini black and white trade paperback of Path of the Pale Rider, put together lovingly from start to finish by yours truly. And every single one will be unique. So that I have a design. Is incredible. Nicole, there's a design I'm changing up. There's a skull in the background. And it's going to be a different color. Like my, I just packed up my red one because I'm going to a comic con. I'm going to show it off. But yeah. since the skull is red, the edges of the pages are are painted red. And then if you open the book and you see the binding, like what I sewed the pages, that is also red. So I'm going to do a bunch of different colors. And if you get one of these, I will put a personalized message from me to you on the interior. Oh wow! So that I love, is really I love cool. these. They're yeah. so much fun, and uh, they look good. They feel good. And I want people to love them. Yeah, that is cool. Guys, this campaign is alive now. I want you guys to be following around, clicking things around. Uh, where can people follow you? Oh, I'm all over the place. Yeah. Um, like I said, the Facebook group is kind of like where all the shenanigans happen. So you can find us by just searching on Facebook, go to groups and type in Path of the Pale Rider. We have like a single question you have to answer, which is, mm -hmm. do you like comic books to get oh, yeah. in? That's it. Mm -hmm. Um, I also have an Instagram I'm at Lori Calcaterra. I have a TikTok um at Path of the Pale Writer with an underscore between all the letters or not all the letters. Oh my God, can you imagine between all the God. words? So it's yeah. like at path underscore of et cetera. Um yeah. that's the same. Uh that's my TikTok. Um, and then I have uh X, I'm at Path Pale Writer. 
Mm-hmm. I'm on threads at Lori Calcaterra. So if you look up like Lori Calcaterra or Path of the Pale Rider. I don't follow you on threads. I don't have you on threads yet. That's the one. I still yeah. need to get on there more often. I'm not really good at threads and I'm not really good at Twitter. I need to get better at those. I do have a website. Um, yeah. It's www.pathofthepalerider.com. I have a shop there. So if we're in between campaigns and you want to pick up an extra copy of a book, um, if I have some of the variants left of a previous issue, you can purchase those from my shop there. Um, Once they're gone, I don't usually restock the variants. I might every now and again, if it's a newer issue and like someone did a run on them, which happened. Yeah. I went to a comic con and like, Every single of my, the yellow and red Big James variants went and every single one of the black and white, like the, the zombie, she's beautiful. The zombie girl with mm-hmm. her, like her teeth, um, that I sold every single one of those two covers. So I was like, I'm going to have to reprint these, but yeah, like, I don't have any variants left of issue one. And I think I have a few left of issue two, but, um, once they're gone, they're gone. But yeah. you can get them from the website. You can get digital downloads from my website. You can purchase digital downloads from ASAP Imagination right now from the Anyone World website. You can also purchase books, I think, on chartercomics.com. Um, I'm in some physical stores here in Texas. Barnes and Noble never... soon. Hopefully, hopefully Barnes and Noble soon. <laughs> knock on something. That would yeah. be so cool. Uh, once oh, we get that, God. that'll be all over social media. Woo. Oh, yeah. And then I want to make sure you guys, and I'll have all these links, but I want to make sure you guys also check out the YouTube channel uh, because yeah. you have a bunch of your fun, like it's news crazy. posts and stuff like that of crazy <laughs> things going down. <laughs> yeah, my YouTube is kind of a catch all. I have Path of the yeah. Pill Writer. I have martial art videos because I do that too. So I yeah. like, you know, you can see me stick fight and um, review, uh, what was I reviewing? A karambe. And I reviewed like a hair spike for somebody. Um, stabbed some fruit with it. It was great. Hair weapon is one of them. Seeing right here. Yeah, that's the one I like. I murdered a honeydew. It was hilarious. (laughs) Um, I have the slice and dice that are on there. If you want to see me dress up as Pikachu and murder a watermelon, we've done that. (laughs) What the heck? Might as well. What the heck? Right. (laughs) I have the Tuesday Morning Brew, which is my podcast on Tuesdays, where I interview any and all indie creators, actors, actresses, novelists, whatever. Mm-hmm. And then um, I have any one world showcase. I also started a new list. I have kind of been neglecting it, which is eat good food before you die, mm-hmm. where I make um, delicious things like homemade cheese, um, coffee creamer, um, macaroons, whatever else I feel like barbecue sauce. I just made a batch of hot sauce for the, the Comic-Con and I put it in packets so people can get free samples wow. of the hot sauce. How hard is it to like, do that in little packets like that? Oh, it was insane. It took all day. Because first oh, you got to yeah. make the hot sauce and then you yeah. got to pack it. And I, I didn't even get close to like, I bought 500 packets. I think I maybe we filled um, maybe 200. Yeah. But it that took all day. Easy. Yeah. <laughs> um, it took all day, but we got, we got it going. So it went yeah. quick towards the end. I can imagine being your neighbor and like, she's out there doing karate now. And the next yeah, day she's I'm making like, hot sauce. Yep. I know people watch my social media like, what don't you do, Lori? Exactly. And I was like, well, today I was knife fighting tomorrow. I'm binding books. I'm going to write a script later and I'm going to take my kids to archery <laughs> and I'm going to, I don't know, bake banana bread. Like there what? we go. Why not? All right, guys, make sure you follow Lori everywhere. Again, all the links in the description. It's such a fun blast talking to you every time. I appreciate it. Thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. All right, guys, again, follow everything up and we'll see you next week. Bye.